Oh, I'm giving some feedback, uh, some breathing feedback, but okay, I think it's better now. Thank you. So, uh, you know, good, good afternoon, everyone. And, uh, you know, I'm very thankful for this special opportunity to sort of address you and especially uh, thanks to Eric Vales uh, for, for inviting me. And you see me holding this thing because uh, I'm just trying to improve the amplification. Uh, so I will be less animated than usual, but I still have my right hand to work with. So this afternoon, I want to share with you, you know, my own journey into uh, nature poetry. Uh, well, the, the, the truth is that I'm not much of a poet and I'm really a philosopher by training. So in fact, my own interest is in, as I said, as uh, Chu Hang shared, uh, the medieval thinker Aquinas, whose ideas I found relevant for contemporary questions in ethics and education. But, you know, as, uh, a couple of years back, a few months back, I was really struggling with, to understand Heidegger. And, you know, as you know, Heidegger is one of the most important philosophers in the 20th century. And he was a gap in my own understanding of continental philosophy. And I really wanted to fill up that gap, you know. So uh, during that time, I sort of came across uh, Richard Capobianco's work on Heidegger, and I was very impressed with his interpretation. Now, Richard, who is not a friend, has a couple of very good YouTube videos, which I, I recommend, but I especially recommend his two books. He's got two books now, very good, I think. Uh, the first one is uh, Engaging Heidegger, and the other one is uh, Heidegger's Way of, Be of Being, Heidegger's Way of Being. And uh, they are both published by the University of Toronto Press. Uh, they're very lucid, and I found them really helpful for my own understanding of Heidegger. So as you know, part of the trouble with uh, reading Heidegger is that if you are uninitiated with his vocabulary, it really is, uh, it really is very frustrating. It's very frustrating. And the, the truth is that even after you've been initiated in, into his vocabulary, he can still remain very frustrating. So it, it, it does feel, you know, when you're reading him, at least in my experience, as if he's pulling your leg all the time. Uh, sometimes it feels as if he's pretending to say something intelligible when he's not. Or after a while, you begin to sort of arrive at the strong suspicion that uh, maybe he's not saying anything very comprehensible. So I think getting your hands on a good commentarial guide is, is so important, very important. So coming back to Heidegger, one of the things I learned uh, from Richard Capobianco's interpretation of Heidegger is that Heidegger was very interested in what he called being. Being. Uh, spelled with a capital B, B-E-I-N-G. And there's some confusion regarding what this involves, but it appears that Heidegger meant by this being a certain way that natural phenomena manifests to us. He called this nature or physis, physis spelled P-H-Y-S-I-S, -S, which is in Greek. And according to Heidegger, the ancient Greek philosophers experienced nature or physis in a particular way. They did not experience nature merely as things in the natural surroundings. Rather, they experienced nature as full of movement, kinesis. Indeed, nature is that which emerges, comes into existence, and then passes away. So, okay, fine, you say, uh, so do we. You know, I, I see the wind blow and the leaves moving. I see the waves at the, sea, uh, the beach crashing against the shore. And I see the sun rise and fall. I mean... Even David Hume saw this, except that he said, we can't all be sure it will happen again tomorrow. So what's so special about this? So that's a question then. But there is something else, especially that namely for the Greeks, nature is also, as it were, reaching out to you, communicating with you, engaging, engaging you somewhat. And, and it's not in words, of course. It's, it's not like the ants, those trees in the Lord of the Rings we are talking about. It's not those talking trees. But I think you could almost say that for the Greeks, nature is experienced as alive, as it is in Fangorn Forest, so much so that it does not merely grow, but sort of reaches out to us. And we, for our part, are astonished, awed by this mysterious experience of a moving nature that sort of affects us in this way. So this lived experience, this lived experience is the point of departure and the core matter for thought for Heidegger. Now, it must be considered that by the time we arrive at post-enlightenment modern philosophy or modern thought, this way of looking at what surrounds us is completely obscured by a different account of the world that is still very much influential today. There are at least two trends in modern philosophy that obscure this. 
Uh, the first is that the whole idea of something external to us like nature affecting us is thought of as illusory. Instead, modern man typically makes up things in his mind, in his consciousness. You can see this in René Descartes and Immanuel Kant. The other thing is that in modern philosophy, the world is thought of as composed of somewhat unchanging inert stuff, particularly for those thinkers who inherited the language of substances from Aristotle through the medieval scholastic thinkers to talk about the underlying nature of things. Sometimes this way of looking at the world is filled with, as filled with inert, unchanging substances is blamed on Aristotle and the medieval scholastics who followed quite, uh, Aristotle's thought quite closely, although I feel this characterization is somewhat unfair. Still, the point is that there is this experience of dynamic nature affecting us so much so that we are awed and stunned. And the Greek word for this corresponding astonishing awe when so reached out to by nature is thalmazain, translated wonder. And Heidegger calls this the Greek experience. Now, although it's called the Greek experience, it's clearly not something exclusive to the ancient Greeks, but an experience that is found across time in many persons. It's clearly the case that he believed that some poets had the Greek experience. Now, amongst the poets, he certainly thought Friedrich Hodelin who died in 1843, had the Greek experience and sought to say something about that in his last poetries. So Heidegger commented on Hodlin's poetry to try to draw out what he believed was Hodlin's experience of a kind of self-communicating, glowing nature. So I'll read and also flash out uh, the poem Autumn, translated by uh, Richard Capobianco, taken from his book Heidegger's Way of Being. And in this respect, I'm also guided in my understanding by Richard's thoughts about translation, which I find uh, very illuminating. So let me share screen. Can you see that? Okay, let me just move down to Hod Hodlin's uh, poetry. So Hodlin's poetry says this piece, uh, nature's gleaming, the title is Autumn, of course. Nature's gleaming is higher revealing, where with many joys the day draws to an end. It is the year that completes itself in resplendence, where fruit come together with beaming radiance. Earth's orb is thus adorned and rarely clamors sound through the open field. The sun warms the day of autumn mildly, the fields lie as a great white view the breezes blow. Through boughs and branches rustling gladly, when then already to emptiness the fields give way, the whole meaning of this bright image lives as an image, golden splendor hovering all about. Now, one of the things Richard tells us is that many translations translate the word gleaming, thus glanzen, in the first line, as shining, and that's inadequate. Something much, much stronger is needed. So apart from gleaming, other possibilities may be glowing, glittering, glistening, glimmering. The point is that there is something coming at us from nature. So that's really very interesting for me. Now Heidegger also calls attention to the fact that for Hodelin, gleaming nature is a higher revealing. And for Heidegger, this means that there is a special way of encountering or seeing nature, different from seeing merely inert, distant things in the horizon, say a mere landscape. Rather, it refers to the way we experience this nature as moving, emerging, passing away, and relating to us, nearing us, astonishing us. And we are receptive, hopefully, to that with wonder. And I would strongly recommend reading Richard's analysis in his book, The Detailed Analysis, you know, uh, which discusses this. But I want now to move on with uh, some other poems that might say the same thing. And it does appear that there are other seemingly similar poetries about nature, which encircle this same theme of a kind of living nature addressing us 
communicating with us, almost reaching out to us and so affecting us, leaving us astonished, stunned, healed, transformed, or better off in any event. I'll read an extract from William Wordsworth's uh, Tintin Abbey, and I'm especially grateful for Eric Valles for pointing out this uh, po po poem to me. So let me share screen again before I, before I uh, uh, read the po poem. So lines composed a few miles above Tintin Abbey. Five years have passed, five summers, with the length of five long winters, and again I hear these waters, this is nature imagery, rolling from their mountain springs with a soft inland murmur. Once, a, once again do I behold these steps and lofty cliffs that on a wild secluded scene impress thoughts of more deep seclusion and connect the landscape with the deep quiet of the sky. The day is come when again I, when I again repose here under this dark sycamore and view these plots of cottage ground, these orchard, ter orchard turfs, which at this season with their unripe fruits are clad in one green hue and lose themselves mid grooves and copses. Once again, I see these hedgerows, hedge hatch rows, hardly hedgerows, little lines of sporty wood run wild, these pastoral farms, green to the very door and wreaths of smoke sent up in silence from among the trees with some uncertain notice as might seem of vagrant dwellers in the houseless woods or of some hermit's cave, where by his fire the hermit sits alone. These beauteous forms, through a long absence, have not been to me as, is a, as if a landscape to a bland, blind man's eye, but oft in lonely rooms, mid the din of towns and cities, I have owed to them in hours of weariness and sensation sweet, a sensation sweet felt in the blood and felt along the heart and passing even into my purer mind with tranquil restoration, feelings too of unremembered pleasure, such perhaps as have no slight or tri trivial influence on that best portion of a good man's life, his little nameless unremembered acts of kindness and of love. Nor less, I trust, to them I may have owed another gift of aspect more sublime, that blessed mood in which the burden of mystery, of the mist, burden of the mystery, in which the heavy and the weary weight of all this unintelligible world is lightened, that serene and blessed mood in which the affections gently lead us on until the breath of this corporeal frame and even the motion of our human blood almost suspended we are laid asleep in body and become a living soul, while with an eye made quiet by the power of harmony and the deep power of joy, we see into the life of things. Oh, sorry, missed out that little part there. So I think you may know others and perhaps can recommend some to me if you are familiar with these nature poetries. And in the words of Gerard Manley Hopkins, we might say that, Nature is never spent, and there lives the dearest freshness deep down things. Just at this point, I'll have a sip of water before I continue. Now, just at this point, I want to preempt a question. And this is that, so what if there is this Greek experience? You can't run away from the question. And question, and there are dozens of different experiences or whatever, and okay, so... Heidegger's found one that we've forgotten, but so what? It's as if we've forgotten one way to prepare eggs and now we've discovered this ancient Greek way of poaching eggs. So, so what? That's no big deal. But the response to that is somewhat given in Woodsworth's stanza when he says, and I'll share this again. No. Taken from the, from the same piece. But oft in lonely rooms, amid the din of towns and cities, I have owed to them, in hours of weariness, sensation sweet, felt in the blood and felt along the heart, and passing even into my purer mind with tranquil restoration. To them I may have owed another gift of aspect more sublime, that blessed mood in which the heavy 
in which the burden of the mystery, in which the heavy and the weary weight of all this unintelligible world is lightened, that serene and blessed mood in which the affections gently lead us on. Now there's another thing, uh, there's another extract which I want to share also, which is uh, not from poetry, but this is quite interesting. And uh, Sir William Chambers' prose in his a Dissertation on Oriental Gardening also strongly hints at the desirable effects of nature on man while musing on gardening. So he says, Gardening's effects on the human mind are certain and invariable. Without any previous information, without being taught, all men are delighted with the gay luxuriant scenery of summer and depressed at the dismal aspect of autumnal prospects. The charms of cultivation are equally sensible to the ignorant and learned. Lawns, woods, shrubberies, rivers, and mountains affect them both in the same manner. So, the Greek experience confers a kind of nourishing relation to man, and it also affects him in it affects in him some form of consciousness raising. It seems to me there is no clear agreement regarding what exactly that consciousness raising consists of, although there are several overlapping, the overlapping themes amongst these various accounts. And there's a possibility that, that there are several different effects, quite possibly because, and, and quite possibly there is work here to be done and scholarly analysis is welcome. For Heidegger, I think there is clearly the raising of consciousness regarding the value of a contemplative life. So, for instance, in his very late uh, Lathor seminars, very late in his life, he recalls the, uh, uh, the anecdote of Thales, an ancient Greek thinker, who was so astonished by the stars that he set his eyes on the heavens alone to inquire, inquire after what it was that was in it, to the point that he fell into a well. Elsewhere, he seems also to suggest that someone who has had the Greek experience of nature becomes less inclined to behave in a manner that abuses things or people, violently mastering and exploiting them. They are more willing to respect things and persons and care for these in a gentler, nurturing manner, to let things and people be what they are instead of foisting an external imposing will onto them to respect and let grow their inherent, inherent possibilities. Now, to be honest, I do feel that the connection between the Greek experience and these beneficial consciousness raisings is not well explained in Heidegger, even if affirmed. But maybe a Heideggerian scholar hearing this will correct me. Also very interestingly for me, from a different direction, whilst not Heideggerian per se, Pope Francis encyclical Laudato Si, seems to capture quite visibly these similar themes. In that encyclical, he also talks about our inevitable awe at nature or creation. Um, and from this somehow follows that tendency to respect nature and to no more exploit it, and also the desire to inquire after the ultimate source of this glorious vision, to give thanks for it. And these thoughts are discussed as a kind of commentary on the spiritual poetry of St. John of the Cross. But again, there also I found the connection not well unpacked. So I think there is a need to pop the hood, so to speak, look underneath and see and to speak and, and see how it all works, how precisely the Greek experience leads to these consciousness raisings. I have on my own published some work on this. Uh, I drew on ethical, psychological and semiotic resources or ideas from within the Thomistic tradition, that is people working on Aquinas to work out more clearly and explicitly the connection between the Greek experience and the kinds of consciousness raisings or related effects on the human person. There, in those pieces, and just very briefly, I have offered the explanatory suggestion that the Greek experience fractures the animal tendency in us to think primarily about how to instrumentalize other peoples and things to bolster one's own chances of survival which expresses itself as the hoarding accumulation of power. It is after the Greek experience that we better grasp the gentler murmurings of what is called in the tradition the natural law, which, which are ethical principles attentive to others' good as much as our own good. And this sort of leads nicely to the next point. Now the subtitle of my talk has the phrase, a Thomistic appropriation. So 
I want to say a few things about how all of this sits with the Thomistic corpus, that is to say with the thought of Aquinas. And I would say that not everything that Heidegger says is agreeable to Aquinas. And indeed, these thinkers are quite different. And in fact, Heidegger was critical of Aquinas as one of those who forgot being or physis and whose ideas obscured the Greek experience of nature. But I have certainly found indications of the suggestion that our encounter with nature leads to wonder, littered here and there in the Thomistic corpus, and I publish my findings in a couple of works. So a more nuanced reading of Aquinas gives us cause to be a little more tentative about Heidegger's dismissive evaluation of the Thomistic vision. At the same time, I must admit it is not well thematized in Aquinas, so this is an area that I am keen to do some more work. Now, there is one other thought, a final one, that I'm keen to develop, and I want to end my talk by briefly sharing my ideas about these, and maybe you can also help me see whether there is promise in this line of thought. I should say that these ideas may be a little bit more challenging, and having said the above uh, things in plain language as best as I can, I hope to have shared something intelligible to the majority of my audience. I therefore now take the liberty of attempting something a bit more difficult and demanding, as a teacher would sometimes engage those who would feel who would need this kind of uh, exciting stretching. Now, we've been talking about how these kinds of nature poetry capture and, as it were, record these occasions of the Greek experience. And so from the point of view of history, from the point of view of a historian, these poems are important because they allow us to trace back in time the possibility of such an experience or such experiences with its various benefits. So they have a kind of forensic value, you know, like evidence, like blood splatter, even though it's a horrible imagery. They allow the investigator as historian to conjecture more accurately what happened in the past, whether it was murder or a sheer unfortunate accident or like a fossil, which is also a kind of trace. It allows the paleontologist as historian to better conjecture what it was, what, what, what a certain bone in question, whether it belongs to a, just a recently dead dog or more exciting, excitingly to a dinosaur. So the poem, poetry is like a trace, a kind of effect that allows us to read backwards retrospectively signaling to us this phenomenon called nature or physis in the midst of natural things. Thus, Hodlin's poems, for example, helped us abduce or arrive at an educated guess that for Hodlin and possibly others with him, was not just a mere landscape thing out there, but rather a glowing nature, mesmerizing him with awe in the past. Yet poetry is important for another reason. Because I think it's not just the case that these nature poetries are a kind of historical record of something past. Rather, I feel they have a kind of future-oriented pedagogical value. For someone encountering nature and someone unsure about his experience of nature, perhaps his own tottering experience, the poetry does several things. Firstly, as historical artifacts, nature poems give us the greater confidence that our own Greek experience, if it is, that it's not solitary, and hence not necessary, necessarily illusory, as one might be tempted to conclude. Poetry as history stands with us in solidarity, helping, us to, re helping to reassure us that our own present experience wonder is not isolated, not just one-off. Furthermore, and more importantly, Poetic stanzas help, help one give some kind of articulation of that experience. One might not soon find enough, one might not soon enough find words to say that experience of nature, or one might not find the words and phrases to say well that experience. And if, and if such ideas or experiences are not given some kind of articulation, then they run the real risk of being dismissed as some kind of incoherent, mere fleeting, romantic feeling without validation and so are disregarded. 
and repeated disregarding may soon have betrayed one to normalize the increasing inattentiveness to these experiences until it's altogether something one simply passes by. Just as one maybe is finally able to pass by an infatuation that one's heart learns to ignore again and again over time. Whereas, borrowing someone else's poetic account that says it well may have the reverse effect. Here, what totters and risks being silenced has found a borrowed voice which gives the original experience amplification so that it is better heard now than before when without the poetry and its borrowed stanzas, it is prevented from disappearing. Of course, the poetry does not replace the Greek experience itself, and it is likely the re-encounter with nature and the Greek experience again and again that strengthens and concretizes that sense of wonder of Thalmazine. Nonetheless, the poetic stanzas are at the least a kind of support or a scaffolding that prevents the weak stem from weakening further over time, so that with luck, as it is nourished by the days, passing of the days and grows stronger, it may have the chance of finally standing on its own. In this sense, the poet with his poetry is like, a, like an experienced master teacher who with warm assurance holds firm the trembling hand of the young thinker to give him the confidence to take seriously that experience which for a while he may have merely thought he was experiencing and so had not dared to think from it or after it. I end off my talk with a, a final reading of an extract from the poem Wonderment by Carol Votia, and you might know him as St. John Paul II. Uh, and that poem speaks of and to the themes we have discussed today. So let me share that final poetry. Interestingly, it's titled Wonderment. So the, the undulating, you know, by the way, I mentioned that St. John Paul II, or Carol Votiwa, uh, really loved nature. He used to go uh, doing all kinds of exercises amongst the mountains. The undulating wood slopes down to the rhythm of mountain streams. To me, this rhythm is revealing you the primordial word. How remarkable is your silence in everything in all, that, in all that on every side unveils the created world around us. All that, like the undulating wood, runs down every slope. All that is carried away by the stream's silvery cascade, rhythmically falling from the mountain, carried by its own current. Carried where? What are you saying to me, mountain stream? And that's very interesting. It's almost as if he feels there's some kind of attempt to reach out to him. Where, in which place, do we meet? Do you meet me who is also passing just like you? But is it you? Allow me to pause here. Allow me to stop at a threshold. The threshold of simple wonder. The running stream cannot marvel. And, the silently, and silently the wood slope down, following the rhythm of the stream. But man can marvel. The threshold which the man which the world crosses in him is the threshold of wonderment. He was alone in his wonder among creatures incapable of wonder. For them it is enough to exist and go their way. Man went his way with them, filled with wonder. But being amazed, he was he always emerged from the tide that carried him, as if saying to everything around him, Stop. In me is your harbour. In me is the place of meeting with the primordial word. Stop. This passing has meaning. Has meaning. Has meaning. Carol Votia. So you see, there's a bit of a theology wrapped up and you can't blame him for that. He was a theologian. So I end my talk here and I'm uh, thank you very much for your attention and I, I'm happy to take a few questions. Okay. Um, so anyone would like to ask Jude, any 
Uh, Joe, can I just ask you, in, I'm very sorry about the noisy background. In Singapore, where we don't have a lot of nature, and I can see that uh, somehow the, in your presentation, you're talking about how nature has a cleansing effect on our yes, soul. Yes. Okay, so I mean, how in the world can we write poems or be wandering about in the woods when we don't have any in Singapore? Actually, Just we do, you know. Yeah. You'll be surprised, and I'm very happy to talk about this. Uh, because I've been walking about quite a few places. It all started out when I was uh, uh, um, several uh, several years ago. I started playing golf, and uh, of course, the golf course is kind of manicured nature, and the landscape and all was very apparent on on uh, in several golf courses. I used to play, and I still do play in this public golf course called Champions Golf Course, and in it's the in the midst of the forest actually. But the good thing about golf course is that it's quite safe, right? You don't, you don't have to encounter bees and all kinds of things. I mean, things are more, more or less cleaned up. But of course, if you don't play golf, there, there are a lot of places where you have a lot of that. And I've been visiting the Botanic Gardens, which is close to where I stay. And you'll be surprised, you know, there, is, there are quite a lot of places within the Botanic Gardens that, that are very soothing. And 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 and, and uh, sort of fosters a very contemplative mood, you know. Um, I of course quite often we take the MRT and we sort of stop and enter through the gate where the MRT is. I can't remember what gate is then along the along Bukit Timah Road, but there is another one that's near the Raffles um, building, next to a kind of a cafe, and there is a healing garden, and it's 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 not. Uh, it's it's very accessible and it's not a very long walk and you sort of wander inside and and you are you are totally taken out of this city city uh, uh, surrounding you are really enclosed because don't walk too close to the edges and you can see buildings but when you are in, within it and it's quite quite well designed it sort of curves here and there you know uh, and, and and different kinds of plants and 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 especially in the morning when the sun sort of shines true. That's quite an experience. But I must say, it, it all started out uh, in part because of my, my fascination with some of, the, some of the experience I had when I was uh, beginning to play golf uh, uh, in some of the golf courses. And there were a couple were courses near the beaches, you know, and that's another stunning sight. Yeah. Especially if you play, because you try to save money, so you play play during the cheapest hours and that's usually the early morning or the latest and that's ironically the time when you see the, the sun comes up and the, the, and, and the decay day comes to the end. So the whole experience of physis was very apparent because physis is not just things in the background, you know, but this whole complete picture, this whole moving picture of things emerging and passing away, the day coming into existence and then coming to an end, this whole, whole package, you know, man, it's quite something. Thank so you. Botanic Gardens is uh, certainly one place. It's free. It's free. It's it's free, and you know, just make sure you get hydrated. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Any other questions for Jude? Daryl. Daryl. I see Daryl uh, has a hand yeah. raised. Yes, Daryl. Yeah. Hi Jude, thanks for the hello Daryl. Uh, yes. Hi, thanks for the lecture. Uh, I, the ne the name of this uh, the title of this talk is the Thomistic Appropriation of Heidegger. Yes. Um, but I would like, just like to ask in in your in your readings in your study in this on this topic so far, to what extent is Heidegger an unwitting Thomist? I mean, uh, and would this would it would you call it unwitting or would you say there's some element of intentionality behind it? Because but, when we speak of Heidegger's ideas, we speak of Hodelin. I'm mindful that these poets, these thinkers, uh, whether they like it or not, um, inheritors, heirs to uh, the Christendom and Christian thought. Um, yes. So to what extent is Heidegger really uh, appropriating uh, Thomistic notions in his in, oh, in oh, right. uh, philosophy? Uh, yes, I'm, 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 I'm to correct uh, the understanding of my subtitle, I mean that I'm, I'm, I'm the Thomist trying to appropriate Heidegger. Not that Heidegger was appropriating Thomism, but your question raises... It's a very good question, and I want to uh, talk about that. Uh, and I've been looking at Heidegger and Aquinas, and I, I, it's quite clear that Heidegger actually uh, is very critical of uh, Aquinas. But you're quite right. They all somehow have this uh, uh, heritage, 
the Christian heritage that they that, that sort of enters their thought. But Heidegger's, uh, but Heidegger was very critical of Aquinas and thought that Aquinas, to being a, a, a follower of Aristotle, somehow uh, obscured this this moving image of of, nature, of, of of existence of things that are out in the world. And uh, I've been looking at uh, the kind. Uh, some people would argue even saying that Heidegger was very anti-metaphysical. He would sort of uh, uh, would be totally against talking about nature in using metaphysical terms. Whereas Aquinas, being a scholastic, was all about act potency and all that kind of heavy going scholastic language, which is kind of an engineering or rigorous language. And, uh, but uh, some scholars recently have argued that actually Heidegger was against not so much metaphysics per se, but against uh, substance metaphysics, and sometimes Aquinas is thought of as a substance metaphysician. Substance metaphysics would say, say that uh, ultimate reality is some unchanging stuff out there. Uh, and uh, the reason, th those, those reasons, got, uh, 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 actually it's Richard Kapobianko who has brought out this very interesting, fascinating point that Heidegger's uh, thinking is actually uh, sympathetic to what he calls a process metaphysics. So that's something I've been looking at uh, and still am. But uh, it seems that if Aquinas is a substance metaphysician, it thinks that ultimate reality is somewhat uh, static things, whereas process metaphysics like Whitehead is more Heideggerian or Heidegger is more of a process, then you can see a sharp divergence. But uh, I'm still looking at that and I, I, in my own appropriation, so far my appropriation is the discussion of the Greek experiences, experiences very sort of empirical experience as it were. But I think um, uh, there will be differences in terms of Aquinas' ultimate account of what's going on underlying that experience and uh, maybe Heidegger's own account or a white Hadean Heideggerian account of, of that experience uh, if, if we go the process metaphysics way. I hope I've answered your question or at least, uh, you know, uh, uh, pointed uh, uh, pointed out some things that I, I, I've been interested in and, and we can have a discussion further offline if you like. Thank you. Yes, that's uh, it's, it's, it's the question that we, we had, uh, me, and my, me and my friends had when we first saw your, your subtitle. Yes, uh, yes, yes. Yeah. I, I have yes. another question? Yes, please. please. Is, okay. Um, the, the other question would be, um, this uh, your, your comments about uh, Heidegger poetry and what it illuminates about the natural law. Yes. Um, and you made an initial comment also that we can uh, we can observe vices and um, reactions to nature nature in the way that the Greeks described it uh, beyond the Greek experience uh, perhaps in Asian literature especially in Asian literature if you think about uh, yes. Japanese poetry yes. and the interactions with uh, with with nature so yes. uh, I think what would be really interesting and, and this is not really a question per se but uh, is is the Heideggerian and Thomistic uh, approach to poetry as we are discussing it today uh, really applicable in full to uh, poetry from other cultures? Because I'm mindful, and this links back to my previous comment about yes, the Christian yes. heritage, yeah. that the point of convergence for the Greeks and Thomism yes. will be uh, the emphasis on telos. Yes. And even when, yes. you, when you look at po uh, uh, Western poets, when, they, when Wordsworth contemplates Tintin Abbey, ultimately is anthropocentric, right? Uh, they're yeah, thinking about yeah. the purpose of man, yes, yes. Uh, what nature eliminates about man himself. But that's not yes. necessarily the case with uh, other cultures. So it's, uh, it's an open yeah. question and I'm, I wonder how far it applies. Because yeah. when you talk about the natural law, is that, would it yeah. be uh, something that we can universalize from yeah. this approach to poetry or should yeah. we keep it relative, bearing yeah. in mind its constraints? Yeah. Thank, thank you for that. That's actually a very good question and uh, I, 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 wouldn't, I don't have an exhaustive answer, but maybe I just put out a few points and maybe others can contribute. The things that the question it has to do with uh, to what extent does Heidegger or even these Western paradigms of thought about nature and poetry, how do they connect or relate with the, maybe with, with the, with the, with the, with the Asian, a, Asian tradition? And the first thing that comes to mind is that when I'm remembering Hi, there was this book by Reinhard May that argues that Heidegger had certain hidden Asian sources, and that's very interesting. Uh, but I would be very tentative about uh, uh, looking at uh, uh, connecting up. I would I'd be happy to, to do a comparison of them, but I would be very tentative because the thing is that my own familiarity with Asian thought is in Taoism. 
And um, to a certain extent, uh, even when I try to understand the Taoist text, for example, it's metaphysics and it, because it also talks about nature, actually, it also talks about things emerging and passing away. You know, there's a lot of movedness that is hinted in the Taoist text. And even you might say, there's a kind of uh, uh, sense that things renew and emerge by themselves. And we, and, we, and we think about that, we think about the whole idea of Galassian height, you know, letting, the, letting things emerge by themselves and all that in Heidegger. Uh, and, and, but, you know, the thing is that even when I read the Taoist text, I don't just read the Taoist text like that. I always read it together with a commentator like Wang Di, who sort of offers an interpretation. And that, I think that's the, that's the tricky thing about uh, Chinese philosophy is that sometimes it's quite... Um, it's quite murky in certain areas. I mean, the text is open to a several interpretations and it's quite, too, quite difficult to say for sure that this thing is exa exactly that. Uh, so that's the problem. And I, I, would, I, I myself would say, uh, be, if, I, if, I, if I were looking at Heidegger and, or Aquinas and the Chinese tradition, I would be very, very uh, careful and very tentative about making uh, uh, certain claims about uh, this equating with that. I would say maybe there are similarities there, but I would put out uh, some, uh, uh, some qualifications. So maybe, maybe others have some thoughts about this, you know. Okay, uh, Jude, I think we are at uh, one. Oh. Yeah, two okay. more minutes, yeah. Okay. So, and uh, maybe one last question from uh, anybody. I mean, in response to what Jude has uh, said, in response to Carol. Okay. Any uh, hi. Hello, um, hello, Marcia. Hi. Um, thank you for your talk. I thought it was very interesting. I'm sorry I missed the first part. But I just wanted to uh, comment about what you just mentioned about um, when we look at things from Asian traditions uh, with the intent of seeing uh, if there are similarities to yes. w uh, things from the Western side. Um, I think it's important to keep that in mind because um, often we forget that we have our own uh, ways of viewing things and we are influenced by the things that we have been studying. Yes, yes. Um, so, yeah, I just wanted to say I agree with you that, you know, it, it's possible to see similarities, but um, to make claims about whether or not they were truly the author's intent or what he was driven by, I think we need to be very careful when we say such things. Yes, yes. Thank you very much for that, Marcia. Yeah. Okay, so I think uh, we are approaching the end of a talk. Okay, so can, uh, can we just, uh, can I just say a very, very big thank you to Jude for the very, very interesting thought. Thank you, I mean, thank uh, you, the thought-provoking uh, talk, because uh, I'm going to see nature in quite a different way. Okay? <laughs> that is actually meant to be so cleansing. Okay, <laughs> although I'm not going to be doing this Thomistic appropriation. <laughs> you are a philosopher, I'm not. Okay? I'm pretty pedestrian. Okay, so can we just uh, say thank you to him? I'll clap thank you very on my much. End. Thank you very okay, much. Thank you. Yeah, and so, I'm very sorry about the noise on my background. Okay, so no maybe you, yeah, yeah. Thank you, and have a good weekend, everybody. Yeah. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye-bye. Enjoy the rest of the poetry festival. Okay. Bye-bye. See you. Bye-bye. Yeah. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dominic. Yeah. Jude, thank you very much. Thank it's you. It's actually very you. interesting. Thank you. Because <laughs> I first encountered uh, Wordsworth at the uh, set three. Oh. And I couldn't comprehend this wandering about in the woods, what in the world is. Because in the Singapore context, you know, it's so concrete. So yeah, I've, I've only, to... what's worth is not. Uh, there are a few others as well. Uh, some other people have pointed out a few others to me. Uh, quite, 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 quite compelling uh, poetry. You know, I, I, I want to have a look at those others as well. And there's this other one that I didn't uh, use today. Gerard Manley Hopkins. Also, oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, he he does a lot of nature poetry. Yeah. Hey, thank you very much. So uh, I'll, I'll just leave the meeting right now and uh, yes. it's been a pleasure. Bye-bye. Thank you so much. Okay, I have to end. Uh, I'm doing the recording. Okay, so okay. I have to end the recording. Okay. Bye-bye. Okay. See you. Yeah. Thank you.